And uh, because it's such a short letter, we're going to actually read uh, the whole thing, all 13 verses, so don't worry. It's not, it's not too long, but um, starting in verse 1. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, I thank you for this group of young individuals that were able to gather together and sing your praises, um, that we can all in unison sing together, that we want to seek your face. That's what we ask as we go into this time of, of preaching the word, um, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word, in truth and in love. I pray, God, that this would um, affect us and that we would walk out of here um, with a clearer sight of who you are, your glory, and your love. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so, the year is 1979, and what was written or penned that year has probably considered the one-hit wonder of hymns. Does anybody know what it is? What's that? Amazing. Amazing Grace. That's right. Written by the former captain of a slave trade ship. His name was John Newton. This was a man who was oppressive, hateful, as he called himself, a wretch, and he penned the song Amazing Grace in 1779, on probably one of the most sung English hymns of our time. And so I wanted to read real quickly two stanzas that he sang. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour... I first believed. Now, I wanted to focus on two of the lines in this song. "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." So John Newton comes to the reality, the recognition, the realization, okay, that he is wrong. He's evil. He's wicked, okay? He's rebelling against God. Grace, or this truth of God's word, brought to this, his, his mind this reality that he had sinned against God. So it taught him to fear. He realized what a holy and just God he was. Right? We went through the minor prophets earlier this semester, came to the reality of God is just, he's wrathful, he's righteous, right? He's a God of judgment. And so that grace that he's experiencing taught him to fear who God was. But on the flip side, that same grace, that same truth also relieved his fears and grace my fears relieved. Because in that truth is also the amazing reality of Christ's love for him, that Christ fulfilled the law, that he endured the wrath of God, of God for John Newton and for us. But what's interesting is in that stanza, we both see truth and we both see love, right? He was defined actually by these two essential realities, truth and love. He was firm in the truth. He, did, he believed in absolute right and wrong. He believed that Jesus was the only way, the truth, and the life, but he was also a tender and compassionate and loving man. Because he had been forgiven of much, he would forgive others of much. So you see in this man, and in many others, this, this reality that truth and love work together. Now, in today's cultural climate, okay, there is a huge dichotomy between truth and love. Okay, a huge one. We see this namely with the tolerance movement, right? If you hold to any absolutes, if you believe in an exclusive way in Jesus Christ, then you're hateful, you're a bigot, you're awful. You don't love mankind. Okay, that's very much one of the narratives of our society today. 
That there's this, you can't be truthful and loving at the same time, and if you're loving, you can't hold to absolutes. That's that relativistic, that postmodern thinking, right? We don't want any standard. We don't want any right or wrong. That's not the way of loving. What's going on here is the wrong understanding of what love and truth is. But not only in the cultural movement do we see this polarization between the two, but I think we also see it in the churches. We definitely see it in Christian circles a ton. John Piper writes about John Newton in the biography, and he writes this about how people fall on either side of rather being truth-focused or love-focused, but hardly do we see the balance. He writes this, It seems to me that we are always falling up the horse on one side or the other in this matter of being tough and tender, durable and delightful, courageous and compassionate, wimping out on truth when we ought to be lion-hearted, or wrangling when we ought to be weeping. How rare are the Christians who speak with a tender heart and have a theological backbone of still. In other words, what I see a lot, what we probably see, experience a lot in even this community or even in churches along is that rather you kind of fall on one side, rather you're really accepting and loving. In truth, you know, okay, you know, we, we don't need to know what's right or wrong or we don't need to pin down any type of truth about Jesus Christ or I'm going to hold to the truth, I'm going to beat you over the head with it, right? That it's not, I, I'm not going to tell, be loving because that's not, that's not what the truth is about. In the second letter of John, though, he talks about the balance of these two things. You see, sometimes we say, I'm more of a truth-based person than a compassionate person. I'm more spirit-focused, or I'm more scripture-doctrine-focused. Scripture, I'm more logical than emotional. I'm more about the academic or intellect of the faith, or I'm more about the experiential and feeling side of the faith. See, what we see is, though, that Jesus says we must worship, as he says in, in, the, in the Gospels, we must worship in spirit and in truth with truth, and with love. They are both essential. But what's, what's really sad is, and this is, you know, kind of picking back off of what Nathaniel talked about last week, discipleship. If we're going to be able to continue this idea of what discipleship looks like, we need truth and we need love. And a world that's polarized on this issue really needs to see it from the church. But yet the church is one of the places that struggles with it the most, that we struggle with it the most. So I think the second letter of John is going to be very applicable for us but what I first want to do is I want to go through, I'm just going to provide some historical context and structure. I like to do this so that way you guys can kind of take what you're learning here, but also expand on it in the weeks to come. Um, you know, test what you've learned here and get to know more about it. It's usually easier to break down the text. So basically the second letter of John was written to a local body of churches to exhort them to walk in the truth and in the love, but also to beware of some dangerous false teachers, okay? There's a lot of chaos. There's a lot of disorder that's going on because these false teachers, or what some scholars believe to be Gnostics, or to be Gnostics, people who basically deny the nature of Jesus Christ as being human, okay, that deny the incarnation. And that's a huge threat to the gospel, because Jesus had to be fully divine and fully human, fully divine to fulfill the righteousness, right, to fulfill the law, but fully human to represent us as a human race. So to deny Jesus' incarnation is pretty much to say, well, the crucifixion, the resurrection are moot. doesn't matter. They're nullified. So that's really dangerous. And so John's like, look, we can't accept that. So he, he lays out the greeting, okay? That's in chat, uh, verses 1 through 3. He lays out the greeting. And I'm going to provide just a real quick text. When he says to the elect lady and her children, you're probably like, what? I, when I first read that, I was like, what is he talking about? But what I think he's referring to is just the church in general. If you remember in the book of Ephesians, right, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. So it's probably not too strange that he would refer it to as the elect lady, and the children would be the individual members that make up that. If you want to talk more about that later, we can, uh, but that, I don't want to spend too much time on that. And then in verses 4 through 6, he lays out the encouragement and exhortation, and he provides two principles. What do you think the principles are? Truth and love, walking in truth and walking in love. Just making sure you guys are paying attention. And then in verses 7 through 11, there is the warning, okay, the warning against these false teachers, and he lays out two warnings. Watch yourself, okay, action step, hint, application, and do not receive the false teachers, okay? So you have the encouragement, exhortation, and he provides these principles so that way they know how to handle this chaos and this disorder or what's going on in their current situation. He tells them, walk in truth and love, and you're going to need that when it comes to confronting these false teachers, which means that in a quick application step, we need to know the principles of how to love and how to be truthful when it comes to the chaos and the disorder in our society today, okay? That's what the world's paying attention to, and we can't 
lose one side or the other. Okay, we can't become too truth-focused that we forget the love, and we can't become so love-focused that we forget about the truth and the standard of reality. So that's kind of just a little bit of something I want to lay out, and, but I also wanted to add some clarifications because when it comes into do not receive him into your house, the false teachers that he's talking about in verse 10, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, you kind of many, immediately thinking like, wow, John, that's really harsh. Like, weren't you just talking about loving? And now you're like, don't receive him, don't greet them. Like, what is he talking about there? So I want to add some clarification. I think the commentator and theologian John Stott really lays out three really helpful clarifications, okay? And this will also apply in some applications later on. So I want you guys to really pay attention to these three. The first is that the Apostle John is referring to teachers of false doctrine, not merely believers, okay? To teachers. These teachers had ulterior motives to come in and try to draw people away from the gospel, okay? They were trying to infiltrate their community and spread this false teaching. It wasn't just a believer who was struggling through these things or thinking through these things or being passive about what their agenda was. This person was trying to disrupt the church setting. Number two, John's instructions relating, are relating to an official visit or welcome. Okay, meaning it's not talking about private hospitality or going out to coffee with them or, you know, having lunch with them or something like that. He's talking about welcoming them in to teach and lead. Okay, so like a false teacher comes into Catalyst, of course he's welcome. Of course I want to talk with him. Of course he can hang out and listen. But that's a, that's a far cry different from him coming up here and allowing him to teach his doctrine, right? It's very different. So basically he's just talking about official visitor welcome. And usually during this time, they would meet in the houses. And when you provide that hospitality of them staying there, they were using that as a headquarters and a base to infiltrate the society, okay? To infiltrate the church. So John's like, don't, don't help him with that, okay? But he's not saying don't ever talk to them or don't have a relationship with them. Number three, John is referring, at least in this context, to teachers of the false doctrine about the incarnation, not just any false teacher, okay? So not to say that other doctrines or heresies also need to be concerned with, but at least in this context, the harshness is dealing with a pastoral and church crisis, okay, about a denial of the incarnation. So when it comes to kind of struggling with that, like why is John so like, you know, hard fast about this, that's kind of just some clarifications to help you guys. And then there's the farewell, verses 12 through 13. But that's kind of a bit of the structure um, of the, the letter. Now I wanted to focus on those two principles, walking in truth and walking in love. Number one, okay, number one principle, stick with the oldies. Okay, stick with the oldies. It says here, walking in the truth, verse 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Then he writes this in verse 5. Not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. This is the commandment just as you've heard from the beginning. So he says it's not a new commandment, and then he says two times, it's from the beginning, it's from the beginning. Okay? And this commandment, that you love one another and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, was found way back in Deuteronomy. Right? It's something that has always been there, and that's the truth. So what's common in today's age is that we kind of want to rush away or go beyond scripture, right? We want the latest fad or the newest teaching or the newest ideas, but we always kind of neglect the oldies, right? So I know some of you guys, you guys really like modern music, okay? Most of you do, because that's your generation. Most times, like my mom, when she was living in the 80s, she loved Madonna and Billy Joel and all those guys, right? And then you guys, you like, I don't know, who's, who's like some popular people, name some artists? Who? Okay, John, I don't know who that is, but sorry. <laughs> See, so for me, I really like the 60s, 70s. You can't beat those, okay? You can't beat Benny King. You can't beat Sam Cooke. You can't beat Bob Dylan and Beatles. In fact, all you guys who like modern folk music, you have the Beatles and Bob Dylan to thank for that. So the whole point, though, is you can't beat the classics, right? You got to stick with the oldies, okay? So that's kind of the idea with the word of God. I know, I probably messed up the music genres. That's okay. <laughs> but you can't beat the classics. The same thing with the word of God. Okay, that's the standard of reality. That's what we need to go back to as Christians. This is our firm foundation. Everything we know about God, everything we know about the Holy Spirit has to come through here. Now, people can help us on that way, but sometimes, and I'm even guilty of this, we rush away to listening to our nearest commentator or Bible teacher, and we don't listen to the Word of God. I was talking to Nathaniel about this um, the other day about application, but sometimes when we have difficulties or questions about life or we're struggling through things, we don't go to the Word of God. We go to our favorite Bible teacher. You know, like, I'll go to pa ask Pastor John, 
maybe more times than I should, you know, or we go to listen to our friends, but we never consult the Word of God. And if we really believe that the Word of God is the standard of truth, then we need to go to it. Now, there's a couple objections and attitudes that people have towards truth, and maybe you're more of a love-based person that you're more about the emotions or the experience, and you think truth or logic or those things aren't very important. Well, I'm sorry to say this, it is, but don't worry, the truth people, I'm coming after you next. Okay, <laughs> number one, it's irrelevant to our times. The Bible is irrelevant, okay? But the Bible is, is not necessarily an exhaustive encyclopedia, it's more of a lens by which to view the world. So what I've done in each sermon is I brought up a song, right? And I talked about the people behind those songs and why they wrote those songs. What those people were doing, and they do this in film and in art, is they're trying to make sense of the reality or their experiences. They're trying to find that truth. See, Bob Dylan was trying to figure out, he was seeing and making sense of the oppression of the government. Okay, and he thought his answer was finding it through drug Drugs and sex, okay? The sex revolution and the drug revolution in the 60s and 70s. That was his answer and solution to the problem. He was trying to make sense of the reality. That was the lens that he was looking through. Then you had John Lennon, who was trying to make sense of the war and the killing and the destruction or the, the religious hatred. And his solution was, let's just do away with God. That's my solution. That's how I make sense of reality. Or Freddie Mercury felt that shame and that guilt. He didn't know what to do with it. And so he thought, I'm just going to escape into oblivion quote, nothing really matters, unquote. That was what he was trying to do. These singers have tried to make sense of reality and truth and that come up with their own solutions. John Newton was trying to make sense of the oppression that he had caused to all these people. He was trying to make sense of the shame and guilt that he felt, but the solution was, oh, grace in Christ, the love of Christ, my fears relieved, okay? See, it's, it's everywhere. That's the whole point of songs is that we kind of relate to how do they figure out what's the solution. And the Bible tries to make sense. It makes sense of the reality that we see before us. It makes sense of what is meaning, as Timothy Keller talks about. What is identity? What is freedom? What is hope? What is satisfaction? The Bible is not an exhaustive encyclopedia, but it is a lens by which to view the world. So it is very relevant because it answers, and I think it makes sense of most of the things we see in reality and experiences we have more than any other religion or worldview, okay? So that is something that I really want to encourage you guys, that it is relevant, and we have to give the Bible a chance. Most of the time, we just kind of overlook it, but it's because we haven't really done the hard work of studying and doing our research. We're, we're a culture that loves to just overview things, right? We don't want to really look into something. We want to develop opinions or ideas before we even do our homework, okay? So that's not okay. So that's number one objection is it is irrelevant to our times. Another common one is you get frustrated because it just seems like everyone has a different interpretation or understanding of Scripture. The truth is just kind of the slippery thing that you can't get a hold of, right? Well, that's not a really good reason then to deny the Bible or say it's irrelevant or I'm going to push it off to the side. And some of you, whether you guys are, you know, non-believers or trying to figure out about your faith or whether you are believers and you just simply don't read God's Word because you don't think it's really helpful. Everyone's got these different ideas. We can't really ever know what truth is. Well, that doesn't mean that we disregard the Bible, okay? It's the same thing. When there's a traffic accident on the highway, most of the time it's because of operator failure, okay? In fact, the statistics say 94% traffic accidents are called by operator failure. About 2% are caused by vehicle malfunction. So in the same way, when we're struggling with understanding God's word or not handling it right, is it because of God's words malfunctioning or is it because of the operator failure? Especially in the sense of like, the worldview of Christianity, if mankind is sinful, prone to error, finite or limited, then of course I'm not going to fully be able to understand Scripture all the time. And so if there's struggles with that or we see different interpretations, it doesn't mean that it's the Bible malfunction. It could be because of us. So that's not a good excuse to just throw away Scripture. The other idea is I'm more of a spirit-focused, experience-driven Christian. So truth is kind of, maybe you have a bit more of a relativistic understanding of the Bible. Right? Maybe you are a Christian, but you have, you're more prone to think truth is not as important as emotions or the spirit. Well, Jesus says to worship in spirit and in truth. Right? That's what he told the Samaritan woman. And how do we come to know the spirit in the first place? Through God's word, through the content of God's word. So we don't want to dichotomize those two things. They're essentially very much important. And the Holy Spirit speaks through the agency of the word. Okay, Romans 10, how would they believe unless they've heard? How would they hear unless someone's been sent? How will someone be sent unless, unless they go? So that's the same idea, and whoever calls the name of the Lord shall be saved because they hear the word of God, and that's how the Spirit works. So they're not 
they worked in tandem, right? And we had to figure out how do we have that balance of truth and love together. Number four, though, and this is the really big one in today's society, if you want to be truthful, that means you have to compromise love. If you want to be truthful, that means you can't be loving. But the substance and the content of the truth of Scripture is what? Is love. What's the story of the Bible? It's about the love of Jesus Christ. And so when we hold to the truth, we're not trying to preach hatred. We're not trying to preach, you know, not wanting to help humanity. What we're saying is the content, the substance, what truth is. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's, it says life at the end of that, meaning there's hope and there's love because of Christ's sacrifice for us. So there is no dichotomy there. So we need to stick with the oldies. We need to stop trying to run away from God's word and really bank in on it. Number two, though, is you got to sing the oldies, okay? I know it's a little cheesy. you got to stick with the oldies. Number two, you got to sing the oldies. Um, it's really cool. Every, every week when we come to Catalyst, right, some of you guys lift your hands up, right? Some of you guys are singing. You're expressing, and you're, you're, you're relating to the song that's being sung, right? That's kind of the idea of, worship, of a worship setting, is you're experiencing and you're expressing the song. When you really understand and grasp truth, when you really understand and grasp the gospel of Jesus Christ, that should naturally translate into an expression of love. If you've been loved much, then you should love much too, right? If you've been forgiven much, you should forgive much too. See, John Newton, right, to his grace that taught my heart to fear that truth, that reality that of Christ's love for him translated, okay, was transforming him to love others. So if you're not loving people, then it could be that you don't know the truth very well. What, that's kind of the difference between having a head knowledge and translating it into a heart knowledge. Which side do you land on? Do you have zeal without knowledge, or do you have a bunch of knowledge without zeal? Right? It's kind of that balance, right? Everything is, usually goes back to that balance. What it says in John, you know, he talks about in, that, in verses 4 through 6, right, that we love one another. That's the commandment. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. So walking is following God's commandments, but how do you know God's commandments? You know it because that's truth, right? That's the function of knowing, of knowing something. So truth is essential to loving, but nonetheless, it has to be expressed in loving. Our song should be the gospel, and we should be singing it every day of our lives. Not like, you know, oh yeah, you know, John 3, 16, you're singing it like, you know, VBS song, but loving people, forgiving people, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, tenderness, right? Long-suffering, forgiveness. Those are parts that, those are the fruit of the Spirit that's working you and translating into love. And there are, of course, many objections for those of you who maybe are more logical-based or more truth-based, and you think, but you have a hard time loving. You ever been around those people who are very, like, intellectually minded or, like, are all about logic, and when they come and talk to you, they don't, there's not a tenderness, there's not a love? Maybe, maybe, maybe I've been that person. Usually I, I struggle more with this side of being loving, right? But they're both, they're both in tandem. They're essential, okay? I'm, I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but it's, it's pretty important. <laughs> Truth and love together. Number one, one of the common objections is emotions and affections are irrelevant to walking with Christ. When I say emotion and affections, I'm talking about the deep-rooted affections of the heart, okay? I'm talking about the desire. When you're singing, I desire you, God, we seek your face, that's what I'm talking about. That sense of desire for God and desire to help others. Doing, as Nathaniel was talking about last week, doing spiritual good. You have to have a motivation. You have to have a drive for that based off of truth, based off of knowledge. They are very irrelevant because what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Those are affections and attitudes, guys, okay? Fruit of the Spirit isn't you know, give 10% of your money to the church. The fruit of the Spirit isn't, uh, you know, give some money to this charity. The fruit of the Spirit isn't, let the person get in front of you in the line at Starbucks. No, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, and you have to have those things, but they only come from a knowledge and an experience of Christ's love for you. You see, the Pharisees had a knowledge of, of God. They had a knowledge of Jesus Christ. He was there in flesh and blood, and the disciples did too, but they both had two different perceptions and the Pharisees looked at Jesus and said, we think you're a blasphemer. You, we think you're a son of the devil. And then Peter says what? You are the son of the living God. You are the Messiah. You are Christ. The difference is one experienced the love and compassion of Jesus, and it, that truth really sunk in as a heart knowledge, and the others were like, eh. 
So it's really important. Having knowledge of God and just having that logical assent to, I believe God exists and I believe Jesus Christ exists and he's the Son of the living God is not enough. Okay? There has to be that emotional, there has to be that affection that comes out. When I say emotions, I'm not talking about superficial emotions or moods. Okay? I'm talking about affections, deep-rooted affections. Number two is that emotions, affections, or the heart, it's just too abstract. It's not practical enough. Give me some rules. <laughs> and for you guys as engineers, okay, you guys like to have things, you know, very practical, cut and dry, okay? And sometimes the heart's like, what are you talking about? It's not like a Hallmark movie here. Like, let's get some definitive stuff here. So, but the, the idea is that these are principles that, that live and play out. You can have all the rules. You can have, that's what the Pharisees had. They had the Talmud. They listed out, I mean, painstakingly, each detail of how to follow the law, yet they did not have love for God and love for neighbor. Okay, what this is is, is a, an experience that we need. It's really important that we can't downplay the experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And number three, I'm more of a truth-focused, kind of the opposite of the other one. I'm a truth-focused, word of Scripture only Christian. Okay, well, what does Jesus say? I'm going to say it again. He says to worship in spirit and in truth. Okay, it has to live out. But the problem in our Western world is we see this dichotomy. You know, maybe some of you guys are like, ah, I don't know if I get this. It's like, that's because you're thinking of it in two categories, you know? We like to think, this is church, this is secular, this is work. And in the Western world, we like to dichotomize and categorize things. But really, what we fail to realize is how these things work in tandem. We need to be grounded in truth, but we need to express in love. Love is expressing the truth. And truth is expressed, or ought to be expressed, in love. A quick application, which one do you neglect more? Which one do you neglect more? Are you more prone to advocate for truth without loving others? I'm going to hold to right doctrine, right truth, but I'm not going to have any tenderness or compassion? Or are you more about, we'll just accept what everybody does because it's okay? So that's something that we have to ask ourselves, is which one are we neglecting more? Well, number three, how do we practice this love and truth? So we have the principles, right? John, in the first half of the book, has his principles. Now he wants to play this out. How do we use these uh, truth and love to deal with this chaos and this disorder in the church, these false teachers? Well, I got about five applications I want to go through real quick. Number one, what does he say? Watch for yourself. He doesn't say, watch for others first. He says what? Watch out for yourself. Watch yourselves. Okay, many times we are quick to want to go and correct other people. Well, you're just not, you know, loving, or you're just not very truth-focused. In fact, some of you may be here thinking, man, I really hope so-and-so is listening to this sermon today because, man, they're like all about the truth, but they're hateful. Or so-and-so is all, you know, about the Spirit and, you know, wanting to fill things, but he's not really grounded in Scripture. And so, you know, think, <laughs> you watch out for yourself first. We can't be judging people. As I'm preaching this, I can't be looking at you guys, right? I got to be looking at myself first. Watch out for yourself. Number two, for those who are probably more based off of the love or the feelings, you need to not compromise the truth. Okay, the temptation is to think that love, when you love someone, you have to compromise the truth. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, though, and he was literally committing the, the greatest sacrificial act of love, it didn't mean he was accepting their sin. Him dying on the cross as an act of love wasn't saying, I'm doing this because your sin's all right. What? No. He's doing it because he's trying to save us from our sins. You see? In fact, most doctors, okay, they cannot withhold medical information. Any information about a sickness or disease that may be threatening your life, their life, you cannot withhold that. So as a Christian, if you want to be loving, you shouldn't withhold the information that, hey, you're wrong before God. Doctors go to jail for that. Okay? That's why discipleship and evangelism are so important because we have an obligation a moral obligation to express the truth to people because they may be in rebellion against God. So if you don't express the truth, that's also not loving. But when you do, it should be with tenderness and compassion. You see, if you're not expressing tenderness and compassion what, when you're expressing that truth, it probably means you haven't really experienced that truth either. It means you probably haven't experienced the forgiveness and love of Christ. Just like the unforgiving servant, right? Right? was forgiven of much, and then he goes to the servant who owes little, and he just throws him into jail. And the, the, the master's like, I don't think you really got it. <laughs> Did you see how much I forgave you of? So it's the same thing. They're both, you see, they're both in tandem. Number three, 
You need to stand for the truth, not for your opinions, okay? Everyone is, is almost, all of you guys, all you students are under 30 years old, I believe. If you're not, I'm sorry, you're still here. Um, <laughs> we'll pray for you. Um, but you guys don't know that much, and I don't know that much. And we need to have a humility when it comes to those things. When I was, talk, I was talking with a non-Christian, a non-professing believer a couple weeks ago, and he was saying that a lot of people lack, this is a big word, epistemolog epistemological humility. And epistemology means knowing something, how to know something. A lot of people think that they know things when maybe they don't. They don't do their research. Some of you, and even me at times, we're like, I am sure this, of the truth or interpretation of this scripture, but I've only read it once. But I'm so sure. We don't do the hard work of studying. We, we, we jump to conclusions and we jump to opinions before we have the facts. We see that on social media all the time. How many of you guys, uh, I'm, I, this may not work out for me, but how many of you guys have ever looked at an article on Facebook, never read the article, just read the headline and liked it? Anybody? Mm. Okay. You know what happened there, right? We jumped to an opinion before we even read the whole thing, before we even looked at it. That's what we do with God's word. A second John says, walk in truth. Walk. Okay, it's, I think it says love and walk in truth. I think that's my interpretation. Okay, that's not okay. And the problem is we start standing not for truths, not for essential truths, but for opinions. And then the world wonders why Christians are so bigoted and hateful. Or they, they don't think hard enough. Or they don't have the answers. Because you don't. It's okay to admit you don't know something. It's okay. I am learning a lot. I can't, I, I don't feel like I know Second John super well enough that I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm the best teacher for this letter, okay? I don't know it backwards and forwards. I wish I did. But I have to admit that there's some things I don't know. If you come to me and you're like, hey, Nick, do you know about this? Sometimes I'm going to be like, I don't know. Go ask Nathaniel. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we don't know, and that's okay. But the world will respect that. People respect that when you say, look, I'll figure it out. I'm going to work with you to try to figure out these answers or these problems. But don't, don't be hateful and bigoted about it. Make sure you admit to yourself that I have a lot to learn, and that's okay. The last is focus on the essentials. John was very adamant, okay? He was very strong on this issue. Why? Because he was dealing with false teachers who denied the incarnation, an essential doctrine, an essential truth. Okay, he wasn't splitting hairs on you know, what type of worship style? You know, this guy likes violin-based instruments. Don't receive them. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> he's also not talking about um, how many times do we perform the Lord's Supper? Well, I don't know. We don't want to receive any Armenians, or we don't want to receive any Calvinists. He's not talking about these things. He's talking about the denial, okay? He's talking about the deceiver. Deceiver is a pretty strong word, meaning in relation to men, he's trying to trip them up, and an antichrist. In relation to God, he's opposed to God. He's, he doesn't have the love of God in him. He's not after glorifying God. He's not after seeking God. He's talking about people who are adamantly against the Christian faith and trying to infiltrate the church. So the question is, which hill are you going to die on? A lot, of you, a lot of us die on stupid hills. Stupid, the stupid fights. You know, like worship style. Stupid hill to die on. I'm sorry, okay? It, and what, and even with other little minor issues that we don't hold fast, we need to focus on the essentials, okay? The essential is the personhood and the work of Jesus Christ. That needs to be the focus. That needs to be the focus. And the last, and I thought this one's actually kind of funny. Maybe you don't think it's funny, but it says in verse 12, the final greetings, I would rather, Paul, John says this, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy might be complete. This is a fun one. A lot of us feel comfortable, okay, ranting and raging and raving on social media, group me, and all those other things. And we don't actually deal with people face to face. Because here's the thing, in social media, if some person named like, you know, John Gallagher or something, or, or John Smith, or, you know, whoever lives in Virginia, okay, I feel comfortable saying whatever I want to say and ranting and raving because there's no consequences. Because I'm not going to see him face to face. But that's not, what's that? Unless you do. Unless you do. Yeah, that, that would be very ironic. Um, but yeah, 
It's not face-to-face -face interaction. What we like to do is we feel better, we feel safer ranting and raving. Some of you guys, some of me, like even me at my times, when I argue on Facebook, I would never say those things in person. I would never do that. But it's funny because John prefers to talk face-to-face. -face. He wants to show his, he's got, you know, like, like when Nathaniel was talking about with Jude, and even all these, a lot of these apostles, they were concerned for their church. There was a love for the church. They wanted to interact. Do we want that in the same? When you, have a, when you need to work through difficulties or, or you know, maybe there's something that's you know, being taught that's wrong, do you, in, do you like face-to-face -face interaction? Because that forces you to have to realize that this is a human being before you. Okay? Not just some you know, dis, you know, Facebook profile or avatar on the other side of the screen. It's a real human being with real feelings and a real struggle and a real story. The conclusion, though, is that no one ever did a better job than Christ at balancing truth and love. No one ever did. You see, he was the first one to lay down his life for us. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I mean, he had some pretty bold claims, okay? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Very exclusive message, but an inclusive invitation. Okay, very exclusive message, but a very inclusive invitation to all. All can come to me. All who call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Come to me, those who are weary and heavy laden. Blessed are the poor in spirit. He was a very loving, tender, and compassionate man. Are we imitating Christ in our lives, in our discipleship with one another? For those of you who are so adamant about arguing for truth and lacking love in discussions or altercations, are you willing to lay your life down for that person? Do not, do not try to stand for the truth if you're not willing to lay down your life in love for that person, just hold your tongue. If you're not there yet, don't even think about it because you're going to do more damage than good. For those of you who are adamant about only accepting and loving but sidestepping the hard truths, are you willing to love that person by being honest and tackling the hard subjects? Most of us lean on one side or the other too much, okay? Okay. For me personally, I lean a little bit too much on the truth side, but not on the loving side. I find myself getting in discussions at times when, or trying to fix someone's viewpoint without really wanting to love them. Paul says, though, in one of his letters, that he would want to be cut off from Christ so that others may know him. That's a man who has so experienced the truth of God's love and grace that the only way that he can expound that joy is by others experiencing it. He wants others to experience it, and it, it hurts him to think that others won't because they deny Christ. We need to be developing that mentality. I know you people will be like, well, I'm not Apostle Paul. Well, he was a normal guy. He was much like John Newton. These guys killed and murdered people. John Newton tortured and oppressed the African Americans in the slave trade. Paul murdered. He was a genocidal maniac, okay? <laughs> Yet they had so experienced the love of Christ that they wanted to share that with other people. So in the book, or the, the letter of 2 John, we need to have this balance of truth and love. The world needs to see this. This is something that I feel like I, that most of my conversations I feel like is this balance of truth and love all the time. Let's pray, guys. Heavenly Father, we pray and ask that you would help us to have this balance, that we would look to the gospel of Jesus Christ to define how we relate to one another in truth and in love. If there's any side that we're neglecting, rather the spirit and love or truth and understanding, I pray that you would help us know how to correct those things. Maybe to spend more time in the word or to spend more time with people, um, to be loving and to be truthful. I'm always looking to Jesus, um, your son, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He is now seated at your right hand, and I pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you.